right? What was judged uh, by courts as equal work or what was judged as work of equal value, because we think it's important to have in mind always when you talk about equal pay. So uh, equal same work is basically same or substantially similar work. They might not be completely identical, but it's like work. So you had cases in uh, courts like, for instance, of ma uh, female mushroom packers versus male mushroom packers. You, would, uh, you also had a case of uh, China editor in BBC, which was female versus US editor, which was male. But um, the equal pay principle applies also to work of equal value. Uh, work of equal value is not necessarily similar. It, it is a work that can be different in nature but, or appears to be different. But because same demands are made on this work, it is worth the same. So from the cases in national court, you could see that, uh, uh, for instance, uh, what was judged of equal value were midwives, women, uh, compared to technical clinicians, which were men. You had also cases of uh, female nursery staff, classroom assistants, support for learning assistants, compared to gardeners, refuse collectors, and leisure attendants. And you had even in the hotel uh, uh, case of maids in this hotel compared to bartenders in this hotel. So uh, this is something I think important to have in mind when uh, making projects about job evaluation. <laughs> so next slide. Um, so how you establish work of equal value? To establish it, you need to basically determine a work um, of equal value that involves comparing the work of a female employee and a male counterpart by reference to demand made on the workers in carrying the given task. So you do not really compare people, but you compare jobs. And the directive points to the four essential factors that are factors that were established by the European Court of Justice. It is mentioned in Article 4.4. These are particular skills, effort, responsibility and working conditions. And basically, um, all the evaluation experts will tell you that these four factors are considered sufficient to eval evaluating all the tasks performed in an organization, regardless of which economic sector this enterprise belongs to. So we would, of course, very much welcome projects that also refer to these four criteria. Go ahead. And uh, yes, why we're doing this call precisely, it's also about Article 4.2 which requires member states to make accessible analytical tools or methodologies to support and guide the assessment and comparison of the uh, value of work. So this, we believe that these tools or methodologies shall allow employers and also in certain cases, social partners to easily establish and use gender neutral job evaluation classification systems. And that would exclude any pay discrimination grounds of sex. Uh, we also wanted to raise your awareness to the fact that if not used in a gender neutral manner, job evaluation and classification systems could potentially contribute to accurate discrimination because they can evaluate male and female dominated jobs differently and in a biased way. And next slide. Um, and if you wonder how the job evaluation classification system can be potentially discriminatory, we would advise you to have a look at our staff working document from 2013. You will have a link at the end of the slides. And here I give a few examples how these uh, job evaluation classification systems can be discriminatory. So basically, uh, you can have a system that use different evaluation, uh, you, you, you use different evaluation systems for different types of jobs. So for instance, for professionals and non-professionals. You can also, uh, and not be, uh, fail to evaluate typically female job requirements. So for instance, any psycho social competences and responsibilities that are uh, important for a particular job, but they're just not uh, taken into account. You can also use sometimes different evaluation criteria for male and female dominated tasks. For instance, muscular strength and use it only as a criteria for male-dominated workplaces, but not for female-dominated professional workplaces. So this is uh, particularly sometimes a case, uh, for instance, on healthcare workers, when we forget that uh, the nurses carrying bodies also need to have a muscular strength. It's not at all accounted, while, um, I don't know, in construction sector, it's uh, 
accounted and with high scores. Um, then you can have also disproportionate weighting of requirements, which are typically male dominated. For instance, muscular strength is sometimes it's a bit of legacy of the past that in the past you needed a lot of muscular strength. Today you have machines, but you still value muscular strength a lot and then the pay corresponds. You can also have discriminatory interpretation of requirements, such responsibility, which quite often is only considered as managerial responsibility, so management of people and uh, other types of uh, responsibility are sometimes forgotten. And there are more uh, examples in this um, staff working document. You can also find some examples in ILO guide on what are, let's say, practices to be avoided. Next slide. Um, so, yes, as mentioned, the, the no, this is the wrong side. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide. Next slide. Yes. Uh, so, uh, what are the tools, methods to establish work of equal value? Basically, what you need to do is to determine the hierarchy between different jobs. You need systems that establish the relative value of jobs, not the value of job holders, as I said. In principle, it's not linked to actual performance of job holders, but it is comparisons of jobs and requirements. So very important, not the job holder by requirements on a job being are being evaluated or should be evaluated. Um, and uh, as mentioned, analytical job evaluation methods based on comparison of different factors and their importance and complexity are considered the most appropriate for job evaluation in gender equality context. So we would very much uh, uh, prioritize projects that focus on this analytical type of job evaluations. Uh, Karina, next slide. So, uh, just also for you to understand this analytical, not analytical uh, systems, basically you have job classifications and job evaluations. Job evaluations are more analytical, they're more complex, they're based on factors, and you can focus on gender neutral factors like the ones mentioned in the directive in Article 4, you would give based on factor certain points and then based on total number of points, you will establish value of job. And this is something that would very much promote. You can also have more simple methods, which can also work in smaller companies, which are more simple job classifications. They're non-analytical, they're basically simpler and less costly but they rank jobs categories without really entering into assessment. And um, the job description is considered at once and you give relative value according to the position in the rank of a job. This is also fine in certain cases, but we consider that we, if it is done without reflection about the value of jobs and having entering a bit more into detail into assessment of jobs, it can uh, perpetuate certain discrimination uh, that was there, uh, like a legacy of the past, as I said. So uh, we would very much encourage you to look more to the job evaluation systems. And next slide. And here, yes, that's what I wanted to say. We give you also some links to the documents where to our staff working document on gender neutral job population classification systems, where you can find uh, uh, a bit more detailed about the methods, about practices that uh, could be detrimental to the respect of equal pay. You, you, we also give you the link to the International Labour um, Organization um, uh, guidance from 2008. And uh, you can also have a look a bit on Equal Pay International Coalition, which is uh, a coalition of governments and other organizations that deal recently with equal pay and have lots of materials that maybe would be useful for you to have a look when you prepare this call. So thank you very much. I hope it was helpful. <laughs> and I give the floor to Kalina. Uh, yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Agnieszka, for these details. Uh, so uh, we would be happy to uh, <clears throat> answer your questions if you have uh, uh, any specific questions uh, uh, in relation to the um, 
projects uh, that you uh, were preparing. Uh, so uh, uh, please do not hesitate to uh, uh, to ask uh, your your question, uh, to raise your hands, uh, and you can also use the chat, of course, if you uh, wish to um, to ask uh, questions. Hello, good morning. Can you hear me, please? Uh, yes, hello. Yes, my name is Roxana. I call from Bratislava. I would like to ask Agnieszka a question on this analytical job evaluation, whether it is a methodology that is well explained in the document, uh, the link we, uh, we saw recently, whether we can uh, work with this and uh, uh, do it properly uh, thanks to that document you mentioned because you have said that this analytical job evaluation of project is less prior prior prioritized uh, so this this is my question thank you yes actually there's quite a lot of detail in the staff working document and also in ilo documents on that uh, uh you, but I mean, you can also do other things. You can e even do the checklist for companies. Um, you know what they need to. If I'm a company, I have no idea where to start. You can even prepare them checklists, like step by step. You need to first of all uh, have a look who you employ, then have a look. Uh, uh, you know, I don't know. Organize. Uh, uh, Committee, I don't know, uh, HR manager sit together with, I don't know, trade union representative. You know, like you can even, uh, we would of course very much welcome if you focus on the job evolution classification systems and guide employers uh, uh, in their yeah, evaluation of jobs that they have and how this can be done, how the factors can be determined. You, know, you can uh yeah whatever you think uh <laughs> would be useful for them but it's not not we, i didn't want to neither to say that we exclude the other projects even like as you see in our call like training um i don't know checklist for employers what steps i need to do to evaluate jobs um, anything that would help them basically thank you agnieszka Hey, Agnieszka, so we have a question in the chat, I see. Um, so uh, uh, the question is, uh, um, in addition to assessing job classification systems, uh, can the tools developed under the call for projects be used to support companies in meeting other obligations under the directive? For example, can they help with the declaration of Article 9 indicators? Yes, for sure it will help because under Article 9, uh, under pair reporting, you need to calculate a uh, few basic indicators for the whole company, but there is also point G, if I'm not mistaken, when every company anyhow that is just, uh, uh, that will be covered by pair reporting will need to group workers into categories of workers doing uh, equal work or work of equal value. So in any case, uh, yes, that would for sure help companies in uh, complying with Article 9. So, yeah, I believe that helps as well in that sense. Okay, great. Uh, we have another question. Uh, can equality bodies themselves apply for funding? Maybe I can start replying. So the answer is uh, uh, yes, but in partnership with the um, 
uh, with the national authorities that are responsible for the directive implementation, uh, right? Uh, Agnieszka, is it possible that equality bodies themselves are responsible for the implementation in I, some countries? No. Yes, it might happen. I don't know all the systems in all member states, but if uh, I think in some member states you have uh, equality the bodies that are part of the ministry, if this ministry is also responsible for implementation of the transparency directive, then it will be the same body. Um, so it depends a bit on if it's an ombudsman and you have a Ministry of Labor responsible for uh, pay transparency implementation, then you need to partner together. If it's the same institution, then I believe you can just do it yourself. Yeah. So what is important is to have the responsible authority in the lead of the project. Yeah, and then the partners can be uh, all kinds of organizations then, if the authority is leading. Huh? Yeah. Okay, do we have uh, uh, another question from the audience? Um, uh, if not, uh, uh, maybe we can uh, uh, reply to some of the questions that we received before that might be useful uh, in this meeting. Huh? So, uh, one of the questions that we received was, uh, uh, can priority two be oriented to finance national methodologies or should it be oriented to help all member countries to implement the directive? So maybe Agnieszka, <laughs> you can help. Yeah, it was uh, targeting at national methodologies, but we do not exclude that what you develop at your national level is also relevant for other member states. Uh, but you are not obliged to invent a pan-European methodology. Uh, labor relations are different in different member states. If you have uh, uh, lots of pay that is determined in uh, through collective bargaining. Maybe you need to focus more on uh, the situation of collective bargaining and how pay is determined there and what would help to assess work of equal value in the collective bargaining. If it's more like individual pay, then maybe uh, you need the project more like to individual uh, focus on individual companies. So, uh, the idea was to, yes, to have national uh, guidance, because that's also what we oblige under Article 4, that the member states, uh, in every member states, uh, they provide um, some support uh, to, uh, um, to uh, employers and, and social partners in their countries. So it is basically to, to give you money so you can uh, comply with Article 4.2, the directive. Uh, yes, exactly. And uh, in this priority, we do not have uh, any uh, expressed preference for transnational projects huh? that we some, sometimes have in open priorities huh, of the of our surf calls. Huh? So uh, it means that, uh, uh, of course, you you can that there there is, there is a possibility to have transnational project also in priority two, huh? but. Uh, this will not be, how I would say, uh, a, a plus huh, necessarily compared to a national project. Huh? So we will be very happy to receive just national projects. Huh? Uh, uh, just to, to, to specify this. Uh, and um, another question was that, uh, uh, can we provide funding already to uh, improving or developing existing tools? So the answer is yes, of course, and we would very much welcome because from various studies, we also see that existing job evaluation classification system are, are quite often biased or uh, cases. I think in Germany, there was the whole food sector that uh, uh, made through the revision 
the social partners reviewed all the collective bargaining in full sector and they found basically, I think, if not all, most of them biased. So, yes, you can, uh, I think we even mentioned it precisely in a presentation, you can uh, make projects to assess existing job population classification systems or how to improve the existing uh, uh, systems. Yeah. Okay, I see we have a new question in the chat. Can one part of the project include data collection and analysis? For example, literature review and evaluation of existing job evaluation systems. So I think we already uh, partially responded, but can you address the first part of the question, Agnieszka, for the data collection? Yes, I guess if you do uh, assessment of the existing job evolution classification systems, yeah, you, you would probably uh, have a look at the data and analyze whether they are biased or not. So, if it, in that sense, yes. Okay, in our list, uh, we have uh, another question that maybe it's of interest. Can the activities include capacity building? for relevant state actors, such as labor inspectorate. Yeah. So capacity building in sense of uh, developing guidance and trainings. Yes, if you have any training for trainers, for instance, because in the end, ultimately, right, you would like to have these uh, agencies or bodies uh, uh, support employers, guide them. So any activities in that sense would be welcomed as well. Okay. Uh, and uh, another question that we received were related to the possible partnerships and uh, um, how to uh, form the partnership and what we uh, recommend. Huh? So do we have any uh, guidance or uh, uh, any uh, preferences for the type of partnerships huh, that we would like to see. Maybe we can uh, speak a bit about this, Agnieszka. But on partnership details, I leave it to, yeah, basically we would very much welcome partnership as, as we mentioned, like uh, equality bodies, labor inspectorates, uh, uh, social partners, Basically, bodies or stakeholders that uh, will be involved in, in compliance checks or in general. Uh, and on type, I think, I don't know whether Kalina can provide some links to other projects or how? Uh, yes, because we uh, we can circulate or maybe it was even circulated through ITCA, I don't know. But we circulated links uh, to our uh, previous uh, calls that we had in the gender equality area that were also restricted to national authorities. Huh? So with links to projects that we founded in 2017 and it was in 2019 in particular, and there you could see how the partnerships were formed. So the, these projects didn't focus exactly on the topic on the pay transparency. Uh, they were related to the gender uh, pay gaps rather, but still uh, it can be an inspiration uh, for you to see how the partnerships uh, were formed. Kalina, I can confirm that it's part in my presentation. So the links are all there and all the projects are there. So um, okay, good. participants will have the opportunity to have all the links. Okay, very good. Okay, so let's see. Uh, we have let's let's have a look at the. There is one more question. question, I think, Kalina. Yes, um, I, see. I see from Greece uh, on which body. Yes, indeed, we do not uh, uh, oblige member states, or we, we leave full flexibility to member states to decide who is uh, uh, responsible body at the national level. So, that's right. Yes, it's. Uh, it's uh, up to the national. Um, uh, it's it's a national responsibility to decide who is responsible. <laughs> okay, and I see we have a question on language. 
which language to use to submit the project. So uh, it is in fact up to you. So uh, you can submit the project in any of the EU official languages. It not, does not necessarily to be in English. Huh? I think you only need to provide the executive summary uh, in English. But we accept uh, other languages, of course. Even if we say that for practical uh, reasons, uh, we encourage English, but uh, you are free to submit it in your national language, of course. And uh, the other question is uh, um, uh, from an organization, a world, uh, world organization in the public employment uh, services, uh, uh, that I think uh, um, we are, they are looking for partners. <laughs> is it correct? You would like to uh, partner uh, with the national authority. Okay. Yes. I'm sorry, yeah, I will just enter. I use the opportunity because sometimes it's just easier to have this uh, direct link. So we would very much like to uh, to liaise with this partner from National Authority and uh, offer the cooperation. But, uh, and I left the contact details down in the comments. So I will be very much grateful if someone contacts us. And of course, I will use the the normal links but this is just to use the opportunity thank you very much okay well this meeting is also for networking to help you uh, uh, to uh, prepare your project so this is part of the game thank you so much yeah and uh, i uh, don't see a new uh, a question in the chat can i answer oh can you, can you hear me uh, yes, Dimitris, please. I am Dimitris. Yes, uh, I um, thank you for your, your answer. Our problem is that uh, with the Greek uh, equality body, as I said, and we are planning on uh, being the coordinators of the proposal that we are going to submit. So what if uh, the Greek law that will in enforce the directive in two years, maybe, when we have the law, says that the a uh, competent body is, uh, let's say, the Ombudsman. But this we will know at two years or three years time and in 2026. Uh, I don't know if you can understand what I am, uh, 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 what our problem is. I mean, we believe that we're competent as a body to do that, but uh, so, uh, the Ombudsman may, may might be the competent body, but this will be determined by the Greek law. You see what I mean? Yes, later on. Uh, for a moment, uh, for Greece, what we have a contact person for the implementation of the directive, let me mm -hmm. check, is uh, Department of European and International Cooperation, General Secretariat for Equality and Human Rights, Ministry of yes. Social. Co so it's your body, no? Yes, it's our so, colleagues. So yes, yes this is uh, this is fine. You can apply. <laughs> I can send okay. you then. Uh, we can send you the contact person that we have as well uh, on our list. Ah, uh, Christina, it might be. It, I, I it believe is, it's your uh, and Elin, and Dalaga. Yes. Ah, Elin Dalaga. Yes. yes. Okay. So and yes, you. you are eligible, fully eligible as a, uh, yes. Okay, thank so you very much and uh, sorry for the uh, intervention. Yes, what, who will be then a monitoring body uh, later on established mm. with national system is less relevant for being eligible for the call. For a moment, what is important is who is the body at national level that was uh, assigned to implement the directive, work thank on you. the national legislation. Which I is see. Thank your you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. And uh, uh, we also uh, have another question that we received uh, before. It is related to the IT tools. Huh? So, is it possible to obtain funding for IT development related to the use of administrative data for reporting and monitoring? by the Labour Inspectorate. Uh, 
So it's a, a IT solution uh, uh, that, uh, yeah, I think they would need to be uh, uh, adapted huh, to the uh, methodology of the directive. Huh? Agnieszka, if you could say some words about it. So it depends what this IT tool is supposed to do, but uh, basically with this call, it's really article 4.2, like uh, how you assess or how you help employers to assess the work of equal value. Any method, checklist tool uh, can be IT tool as well uh, to support employers to assess work of equal value. So if it's included in your project, then it's fine. Okay, uh, I see a question from, it's from Austria in the chat. Uh, so the national contact points have to be the lead or partner in a project proposal. Uh, so you mean the national contact points for the pay transparency directive? So, yes, yes. <laughs> Okay, so the, the the authorities, though they are the responsible national authorities, they need to be the lead of the project. They need to be the coordinator, okay, if there is a partnership, but they can also submit the project alone. Huh? Uh, it's, it's the choice that is left uh, uh, to you uh, uh, with the possibility to have uh, um, I think normally up to 30% of subcontracting is also a possibility. But if it's a partnership, uh, yes, the, the authority needs to be in the lead. Well, uh, I think if we don't have any more uh, specifically policy related questions, huh, uh, I think we can move to the next part of our meeting. Huh? Uh, so this will be uh, the part more practical related uh, uh, to the uh, call requirements, administrative requirements and how to apply. So uh, Yitka, please, uh, <laughs> the floor is yours. Huh? And thank you so much for the discussion on the policy part. Nitka, we don't hear you. Do you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Uh, you so can also I... the slide show up. Yes, I'm, I'm. Do you do you share the content now? Yes, it's perfect. Okay. Perfect. Wow. Great. Good morning, everybody. So my name is Itka Verdict, and uh, I'm representing here the Budget Programs and Financial Management uh, Unit, uh, and I'm going to tell you uh, in the uh, next half an hour. Uh, some administrative aspects of the call. Many of the points were already uh, gathered by Akalina, but I'm going to recall them anyway. And then I will lead you step by step through the application process and also through the evaluation process. And uh, as Kalina said, I'm uh, one of the call coordinators responsible for the uh, gender equality uh, call. Uh, we will start to uh, talk about the evaluation timeline. Uh, you can realize that we postponed the evaluation, the submission deadline from 29th of February to 9th of April. And the reason behind is especially to give you, the national authorities responsible for implementation of pay transparency directive, more time to uh, brainstorm, to realize what kind of activities you want to implement and to constitute a quality application that you would submit on time. We saw that there was a lot of interest, but uh, the time uh, was a big barrier for you. So, hence, uh, we are meeting your needs and we postponed by one and a half month uh, the submission deadline. So, the new submission deadline we are recalling it's 9th of April. Then we are going to be evaluating uh, from uh, April to September. 
you are going to be informed about the results uh, from September to October. And uh, the grant signature is expected uh, between October and December of this year. We have two priorities in gender equality call. Uh, we have uh, overall allocation of 10.1 million euros and minimum grant that you can apply for is 100,000 euros. For the priority two, uh, we have big part of that uh, overall allocation. So we have full 6.1 million euro. There's enough budget for everybody from you to come forward and, and be satisfied. Uh, from this allocation and we sincerely hope that you are going to uh, bring forward uh, your applications. The EU contribution is uh, 90%. Uh, we have some common eligibility criteria that are applicable to both priorities, uh, which is, for example, maximum duration of the action, which is for 24 months, but the duration of the action should be between 12 and 24 months. Again, uh, the minimum uh, grant that you can ask for is 100,000 euro. We didn't specify the maximum grant. Uh, based on the previous uh, experiences uh, from Gender Equality 2022, uh, we see that the average grant that uh, organizations were asking for was around 350,000 euros. Projects can be either national or transnational. Like Kalina was saying, uh, in priority two, we are not uh, going to give you any extra points for transnationality because uh, we also are focusing on tackling uh, national uh, issues, national situations. And activities uh, must take place in any of the eligible countries. Uh, this is mentioned uh, also in relation that we have uh, uh, new uh, accessing countries uh, that, that are um, uh, joining uh, serve, and uh, you can have partners from other countries, you can have partners for international organizations, but you st still you need to implement in the uh, eligible countries under serve. Again, this is to recall, you had already many questions about that the lead applicant must be EU national authorities responsible for implementation of the provisions of the pay transparency directive. So the lead applicant must be these uh, national authorities. As for co-applicants, it's widely open. It can be public, private, profit, non-profit organizations from self-eligible countries and international organizations. Also, we already said that there must be only one application per member states allowed. So if uh, uh, in a country you have several bodies that are pondering uh, submitting applications, so you need to coordinate. You need to appoint one of you who is going to be the, the, the coordinator and uh, the others needs to be partner. We want to really avoid the situation that we are going to receive multiple applications per one member state and then we will have to do the arbitrage. Uh, the application may involve uh, one or more organizations, but as said previously by Kalina, uh, the national uh, body that is uh, uh, implementing pay transparency directive uh, can uh, decide and submit alone the application. It's, it's fully eligible and it's fully allowed. For the target countries, uh, as I was saying, uh, the project activities must be implemented in the eligible countries. And we are saying this uh, especially with the regards of uh, partnerships with international organizations, because you can partnership with ILO, with OECD, or with other international organizations that might be uh, covering uh, outside uh, self eligible countries. Please make sure that if you partnership like that, you need to implement solely uh, within the uh, e uh, surf uh, eligible countries, which is EU and some other countries, which I'm going to uh, show you just now. So for the countries uh, besides EU, uh, we have Serbia, Albania, Kosovo, Ukraine and Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, that's a signed uh, association agreement. Uh, you have the link in, in the call document where you can click and you will see which countries are associated to serve and which are participating to serve. You can see there that the status of Serbia, Kosovo and Bosnia and Herzegovina was already updated. Uh, as for Albania and Ukraine, we are still waiting for ratification. But taking into account uh, that uh, the grants agreements are going to be signed uh, between November and December, uh, we are confident that uh, these countries uh, are going to ratify by then and they are going to be fully eligible. We have three other countries that expressed uh, their interest, which is Moldova, Montenegro and Macedonia. 
Uh, in their cases, uh, the pro process is not uh, yet very advanced, so we cannot guarantee that uh, they are going to be eligible in the end, whether they are going to manage to sign their association agreement uh, by end of the year. So, uh, nevertheless, the, the partners from these countries can be part of the consortia, they can, can submit the, the proposal with you, we are going to assess uh, the project. But uh, there is this best big question mark, is it going to be feasible and are they going to sign uh, by the signature of the grant agreement? So there, there is a, a little bit of risk on the side uh, of the consortium. Now I would like to uh, talk about the lessons learned from the previous calls. Uh, you can see that if we had a restricted uh, a call or restricted activities, we had a very high uh, success rate uh, surpassing 80%. For example, you see that in 2017, we had uh, 13 eligible uh, applications and 10 were awarded and two were uh, put on a reserve list. It means that they had also a chance to get the funding. One uh, proposal was failed based on uh, lack of relevance or lack of quality. In 2019, for example, we had nine eligible applications, eight were awarded and one was put on a reserve list, meaning also giving access to funding should uh, there be financial reserve. So it means that you have very high likelihood if you submit your uh, application that uh, you can be selected for funding. Like I said, uh, the allocation is quite high. The only uh, obstacle between that, it's, uh, it's scoring at least 70 points uh, uh, in overall uh, qualitative assessment. Uh, so that, that is the reason why we were failing, for example, in 2017, uh, that uh, one project. You can consult uh, the projects that we previously funded uh, through funding and tendering portals, but for your convenience, we embedded in this presentation direct links uh, for these calls. And uh, like we already discussed with Kalina, with Anieshka, uh, you have here um, for your inspirations uh, the projects uh, that were funded on the 2017 calls, and you can see that full 10 out of 12 uh, submitted uh, in a partnership. So if you uh, go on the link below, you can see uh, which partnerships, which bodies they took in the partnerships, and you have also for your convenience uh, uh, described uh, from which country these projects are coming. Similarly, we have also uh, some overview for a 2019 call that was restricted uh, on the closing gender gaps um, or for better sharing of care. The, the full eight projected, projects that were selected, all eight of them uh, uh, were submitted in the partnerships, even though it was not an obligation under the call. So again, uh, you can consult uh, these projects uh, to get inspiration, which can be the convenient body for you to, for the partnerships. Now we are going to move to the application and evaluation process. Uh, may maybe some of you are completely new to the funding and tendering portal. Uh, so if this is the case and you never applied before, you will need a pick. It is kind of a unique identification code for the participants. How you are going to obtain it? You go on the funding and tendering portal uh, into how to participate section. Uh, you have a participant register and there you will have the button register your organization. Um, the process is quite straightforward. You will get the pick normally within five to ten minutes uh, after completion. And then with this pick, you can already start uh, the application. You are not going to be asked for any additional documents. Uh, checks are going to be performed once uh, your project are, uh, is going to be uh, selected for funding. Uh, for your convenience, we also attached here the link uh, where you can access the video that is going to uh, guide you uh, through the uh, process of registration. Then you need to decide under which call you want to apply. Naturally, in our case, you want to be applying on the gender equality call. So either you put it in a search on the main page of the funding contendering portal, or you can go via uh, citizen equality rights and values programs. Then you should get uh, to the main page uh, that is dedicated to our call. There uh, in the mid section, you will see a start submission. You click that you are going to start submission for the Serif Lump Sum Grants and you click the button start submission. 
there you are going to start using your PIC that you received previously, uh, and uh, your data are, is going to be pre-filled uh, pre based on this PIC. Already from this screen, you can see uh, the deadline for, for your call, how many days you have left to submit your proposals. You can here download the Part B templates, which are uh, application form, the technical part, part B, and also the detailed budget table uh, in uh, Excel with enabled macros um, format. And if you need more help, you are also having here different categories of help from online manual IT how to, which also features some videos, frequently asked questions, and if you have really a serious IT problems, you can uh, contact IT help desk. Then you click and you proceed with your application further. Uh, here, uh, in uh, the context of our call, we embedded certain reminders. Uh, these reminders are concerning the eligibility uh, to make sure that whoever is applying under priority one, they are the ones that are eligible, and also under priority two, uh, that uh, these uh, people know that that uh, only the national authorities are the, the leading uh, partner. Because, for example, we have uh, in, in the submission systems also some um, applications from the NGOs on the priority two, which is uh, making them ineligible. So you have all the eligibility criteria in the call document that this is for the convenience of applicants to remind you of these eligibility criteria. Also, based on our experience from 2023 calls, uh, where it was for us the first time that we were introducing lump sum funding, we saw that many uh, applicants uh, had uh, uh, problems uh, in filling up part eight uh, in coherence uh, with the detailed budget table. Instead of putting the, the grant amounts, uh, they were putting the, the total cost. So we have also a reminder uh, in this respect. What everything do you need to fill in to have your uh, complete application? So you need to fill in the part A, you need to fill part B, part C and annexes. Part A is a dynamic form that you are going to be filling online. Part B is a form that you are going to be downloading like I was uh, showing you and then you are going to be filling it and you are going to be re-uploading it in PDF format as an annex. Part C is a dynamic form that you are going to be filling online. And then you have uh, uh, annexes. Uh, some of them are obligatory, notably the detailed budget table. Uh, uh, my colleague Philip is going to explain you how to fill it up. Uh, CVs, uh, list of uh, past EU uh, uh, funded projects. For sure, uh, your application must be readable, accessible and uh, printable. And uh, this is how you start with the part A. So you need to click uh, on the edit form button. This is going to create you a form um, with uh, four sections, general information, participants, budget, and other questions. So you can click here on a show or you can uh, proceed. In the general information, uh, you fill the all the important parts uh, of, of this kind of general facet of the project. So what is the, the acronym? What is your proposal title? What is, what is going to be the language? Uh, what is going to be the duration? Uh, some keywords if you want. And very important, you need to choose the correct priority under which you are going to be submitting. If you choose wrongly the priority, basically your application is going to end up with the different pool of, of uh, proposals. And uh, it's uh, technically uh, quite difficult to put you back. So please be sure that you are going to be selecting the right priority. And then you are going to be filling up the abstract, uh, which should be filled up um, uh, in English and you have uh, 2000 characters. Also, you will be uh, making the series of declarations, uh, for example, in case of consortia that you are declaring that you have consent of all other applicants, uh, that you this information that you are submitting is correct and complete, uh, that you are compliant with eligibility criteria, that you are not in an exclusion uh, situation, that you have sufficient financial operational capacity. Then uh, there are two uh, declarations related to funding and tendering portals conditions. And uh, also uh, con um, declaration related to use of lump sum uh, that you are declaring that you are understanding 
that uh, your lump sum it's uh, the reliable proxy of the actual costs and uh, for example that purchases and subcontracted costs uh, must be the best value and must be free of conflict of interest then you start filling up uh, the uh, participant site uh, by clicking on, on the button. You will fill up uh, all the contact details, uh, the positions of the, the contact persons. Then you move to the budget where, as again, we recall, you need to uh, fill up the requested grant amount, not the total cost, very important. Then you need to go through the section other questions, even though it's not applicable for a SERF uh, program. Uh, this is kind of compulsory a part of the of the form. And then you go to the validation results. In case you have some problems, uh, system is going to flag these problems for you. Uh, some of them are going to be noted like errors. Some of them are going to be noted like warnings. By clicking on the buttons behind, uh, you this system is going to bring you exactly on the spot where you have the problem so you can easily correct it. And uh, here we see that the system is describing that we don't have a title filled in that and we don't uh, didn't fill in the main contact positions. So you once you correct all the mistakes or all the shortcomings, you should get to the application form. The validation results will be no validation errors, and then you save and you exit the form. And then your part A is finished. Then we have the part B. Uh, this is the one that you are going to be downloading from the system and filling up and then uh, saving and re-uploading. Uh, it has uh, several sections, the project summary, which is basically the abstract of part A. Uh, then uh, you have the sections of relevance, quality and impact. These are basically having the same logic as later on you will see for the evaluation criteria. Uh, and then you have the work, pro work plan uh, uh, and other and declarations. So for the relevance, uh, we are looking at the background and general objectives, needs analysis and specific objectives complementarity with other actions and innovations. For quality, we have concept and methodology, consortium cooperation, if you have consortium, project teams and staff, uh, outside resources, consortium management, of course, if you have consortium, project management, qualitative assurance, monitoring and evaluation strategy, cost effectiveness and financial management, critical risk and risk management strategy. For the impact, we are looking at impact and ambitions, short, medium and long term effects of the projects, impact on the target groups, in communication, dissemination, visibility, on sustainability and long term uh, impact and continuation. As for the work plan, we are looking at the work packages, uh, activities, resources and timing uh, and subcontracting, for example. In sections other, we are looking at ethics and EU values possible impacts on children and uh, other groups and uh, privacy and data protection issues. Then you have two declarations to make. One is concerning double funding and then uh, one is concerning uh, financial support to third parties. But under this call, the financial support uh, to third parties is not allowed. Then you will have uh, finished your part B. You upload it back in a system. Then you are going to be also filling up the part C, which is uh, key performance indicators. And this is dynamic form. You click the button uh, in the in the submission uh, environment, edit part C KPI. And there you need to choose the uh, main activity type of the project, and then you are filling up uh, the numbers of participants that you are going to be reaching. Uh, please know that uh, this uh, application form is going to be saved and uh, is going to be flagging no mistakes, even if you put only zeros. So uh, be really careful, fill in the numbers in coherence what you are writing in your application form. If you want to know more uh, about how to do the part C, uh, we established two frequently asked questions for you and uh, you are more than welcome to consult them uh, later on in details. And then you are almost ready to, to submit. So you have part A, you have part B that you uploaded, you have part C, then you have, you need to also fill up the, the detailed budget table. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, my colleagues are going to explain to you later on how. You also need to submit uh, the CVs of the core team, of the core staff that is, uh, is going to be implementing the, the projects. 
there is no binding format for the CVs. Uh, you can have uh, free format, you can use Europass. In case you don't have yet the, the person appointed in a team, you need to uh, at least uh, enclose the job description, very, very detailed job description of the post and of the profile of the person that you are looking for. And also list of previous projects. We had previous questions whether uh, if you don't have any previous projects, but still you need to submit. Uh, yes, it's it's one of the uh, requirements. So even if it's going to be empty or with nothing, uh, um, with no projects, you still need to submit because it's uh, it's an obligation. Uh, normally, it should be focusing on EU projects, but if you have uh, other projects that are going to be witnessing uh, uh, your uh, operational capacity, you can feel free to also uh, add uh, uh, other projects that are not uh, necessarily EU. Uh, then you are going to go for validation or submission. Uh, and again, you will see these eligibility warnings. And it's it's kind of uh, for us the last resort to rec recall to applicants uh, what are the eligibility conditions, and what they should pay attention to. In in any case, if you are confident that you are in line with eligibility criteria, you just uh, click on OK. It's not a blocking factor. Your proposal is going to be submitted, and then your proposal is submitted. You go, you get your ID, but it doesn't mean that it's it's finished. You mean you can never. Anytime uh, go back to your proposal before submission deadline, you can edit, uh, you can modify. And uh, what is very important, you should download and check uh, all the parts that, that, that are filled in, whether it's printable, readable, because this is very important for admissibility. Please bear in mind that after the submission deadline, you cannot alter your uh, proposal anymore. Uh, so uh, in case you made a mistake and you attached instead of part B something else, uh, we are very sorry. We cannot act on that anymore and uh, we are going to be basically judging you inadmissible. Another thing what is uh, worth recalling is don't wait for the, uh, the last days uh, before the submission deadline. Uh, try to submit uh, your application at least one week prior the submission deadlines. The reason why it's that uh, these two days before the submission deadline, uh, the situation in the system might get congested. Uh, you can get IT problems uh, and uh, this can result in failure of the submission. So please uh, be uh, mindful of that. And some tips uh, already we were saying uh, uh, do the works prior the submission, well prior the submission, and we also encourage you, don't be afraid of the submission system, play with the submission system, do the testing in the submission system, and go well advanced uh, prior the uh, submission uh, deadline to see the forms, to, to touch uh, the environment, uh, so as you are not surprised uh, several days before when you really need to start preparing your, pre uh, pre pre preparing your application. So don't be afraid about the system, play with it, uh, get acquainted with it, because you can uh, do more submissions than you can delete them, you can withdraw, you can edit. So don't be afraid to, to work. Uh, convert the detailed budgets from uh, uh, Excel uh, with macros to uh, classical XLXX. Uh, don't work two people at the same time because it's, it's going to uh, create uh, for you uh, IT problems. Save your changes uh, frequently because uh, hit often the, the save button, otherwise you may lose uh, your editing. And again, very important, double check after you uh, upload your files that everything is correct and that we can print out, we can read uh, and everything is visible. Uh, we have further guidance for you in IT how to, in the proposal forms and uh, how to also uh, fill up the part B. So after this presentation, you are going to uh, get the slide. So please uh, feel free to uh, get more in touch with these uh, supporting documents. Now we are going to the evaluation part. Uh, we are going to be uh, seeing uh, different criterions for admissibility, eligibility, exclusion, selection, and uh, award. For admissibility, uh, it's basically what we were saying when we were preparing uh, the, the application in your uh, environment. So you need to submit it electronically. Uh, you need to have completed part eight, part B, part C, and other annexes, notable detail budget table, the CVs, 
and the list of previous projects. For you uh, that are going to work with uh, children directly, we also request child protection policy or at least the declaration that you are complying with the principles uh, in the keeping child safe uh, safeguarding standards. Very important for admissibility is that your application must be readable, accessible and printable. Then we are going to move to eligibility. Eligibility is uh, largely elaborated in call documents in, in part six. So we are going to see the profile of the applicant of the partner. So we are going to be determining whether the lead applicant is indeed uh, a national um, authority implementing pay transparency directive or not. Consortium composition, like we said, you can have consortium, but it's not an obligation. So you don't have to have uh, under priority to a consortium. And we can see also the applications for the minimum and uh, maximum uh, EU grant uh, requested. We are going to also verify whether you, you on in a part A, made the self declarations that you are not on one of the situation uh, for exclusion like bankruptcy or guilt of fraud. So this is uh, going to be rechecked. Another, it's selection side criteria, it's a operational capacity and a financial capacity. Operational capacity is being evaluated on the award criteria and the quality based on the CVs of the key project staff members. Um, annual activity reports are not relevant for public body, so it's not relevant for you, but also on the list of, of previous projects. Financial capacity is going to be verified uh, only once your proposal is going to be selected for funding but there are no specific checks for public bodies. Very important are the award criteria. This is basically how we are uh, assessing overall quality of your proposal. Uh, you can score up to 100 points. Minimum pass mark is 70 points, and we reattribute uh, the points uh, in the following way. 40 points for relevance, 40 points for quality, and 20 points for impact. There is also a minimum uh, pass mark for the relevance, which is uh, 25 points. If you don't reach 25 points in relevance, your uh, project is going to be judged as out of scope. Under the relevance, which is uh, 40 uh, points, uh, you will see that we are going to be uh, assessing your alignment with the priorities of the call. Uh, how well you are going to justify and outline your needs assessment, what are your target groups, uh, how do you contribute to either EU strategic policy and legislative context, uh, European transnational dimension or uh, um, potential to uh, improve cooperation also at national level for national projects and potential for transfer of good practices. In case of quality, uh, which is also for 40 points, we are looking at methodology links between needs, objectives, activities, results, and meaningful participation of the target groups, organization of work, work between partners if you have consortium on the time schedule of the project, on the risk uh, identification, monitoring and evaluation, also on ethics and measures in place to guarantee compliance with EU values, so ensuring non-discrimination, feasibility of the project in the time frame, financial feasibility and cost effectiveness. And the last part is uh, for 20 points impact, where we are looking at results, outcomes, immediate changes to the target groups, dissemination strategy, multiplier effect and sustainability after end of EU funding and longer impact. Uh, we would like to uh, stress that uh, you should pay very close attention to uh, section e ethics and EU values, which is uh, often uh, neglected by many participants. There uh, you will see that with respect to EU values, you are expected to explain the measures in place uh, that are going to be preventing any discriminatory or um, other type of behaviors. Uh, this is going to be evaluated in, in a qualitative part, uh, respect of uh, rights of the child and uh, 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 gender mainstreaming and uh, non-discrimination mainstreaming. This is kind of cross-cutting issues that are going to be evaluated under all three categories. Uh, we have also frequently asked questions explaining you uh, 
what needs to be done for the um, child protection policies, how do how they should be drafted, and why and how we are assessing uh, gender mainstreaming and non-discrimination mainstreaming. Here are further reference documents that uh, that we invite you to uh, consult. Uh, you have some documents that are related uh, to application of lump sums, for example, decision on authorizing the lump sums under SAFE program, decision on unit cost for travel and subsistence, decision on unit cost for volunteers, and guidance how to manage your uh, lump sum grant. Uh, you have also the model grant agreement, uh, the detailed budget table. So here you have the reference documents, but uh, be careful. These are the reference documents on the portal. If you want to use uh, and fill up the, the applications, you need to go in the, the submission environment and take documents from there because uh, uh, these uh, model templates, they are not editable. So you really need to take the form uh, from the uh, submission environment. So this is also a very important thing. It's the assistance that is available for you. Uh, you have plenty of online manuals. I was already showing you earlier. You can consult frequently asked questions that are in the page of your call, of the gender equality call. Uh, they are already embedded in there, so just please go through them, read them. They, they can be concerning different topics from financial topics, administrative topic, policy or topics. Then uh, in these sessions, you have a uh, representative of self contact points that we uh, invited uh, because they are our antennas uh, in the member states. They can give you uh, very hands on help uh, and moreover in your national language. So we please, if you don't know who your contact point are, uh, go in the uh, call document in a section 12, click on the link and you will find uh, the, all the contact points. Uh, we don't have them in all the countries, but uh, contact points from other countries are also helping uh, those countries that they don't have contact points established. For IT problems, you can uh, contact our IT help desk, and for any other issues, of course, you can contact us uh, via EC surf calls, uh, functional mailbox. So we are going to reply to you. Also, based on the questions uh, we received and answers that we are giving, uh, we are establishing new frequently asked questions. So this is for me. Um, I don't know, Kalina, what, what is the time, whether uh, we have time for questions or whether we should proceed with the budget and then take the questions? Uh, I think, Itka, we have a few questions that we can okay. shortly address. No like for the limit uh, page for the part B. Okay, so the limit for the pay, uh, part B is uh, written in a call document, so it's uh, 45 pages. Um, unfortunately, we are sharing the same template with other uh, programs or other calls that have longer uh, expand of pages uh, going up to 70, so you will not be blocked by the system if you are going to be submitting a document which is 50 pages, so be very careful. But we are going to only uh, tell to our evaluators read up to 45 pages, nothing um, after 45, so page 46 and on, we are going to discard from evaluation. Yes, yes Yitka, but there is a very specific question related to the uh, part B. Limit. Can you read? Because yes, I, I don't can know. we can we delete uh, um, some sections that are not relevant? Huh? Uh, for example, the section that is not relevant for the lump sum projects huh, to gain some space. Uh, normally, uh, the instructions in the call document say that you should abstain from alteration of the of the part B, and uh, also the, they are giving you instructions which which font it's recommendable. If you are 100% sure that uh, this part is not going to be used uh, and you are lacking space, probably you can uh, remove it, but I, I will be very cautious. And also, please bear in mind that uh, uh, there are some instructions that are, for example, not applicable for prefixed lump sums. Please note that we are not prefix lump sums. So if we are talking about not applicable for pre prefix lump sums, it is applicable for this call because we are not a prefix, we are lump sum, but not a prefix lump sum. So be very careful when, when you are deleting something, maybe something that you don't believe that needs to be filled up, it needs to be filled up. Okay, and there is also a question that I'd like to explain a bit the limit for the subcontracting. Huh? 
So I think it's uh, in principle is thirty percent, but sometimes can be higher. With, is it uh... This this is what we were saying. It depends on uh, what you want to do uh, and whether you have expertise for this or not. So, uh, for example, in other call that was uh, destined to data protection authorities, we allowed even for the higher percentage, but it, it needs to be very, very well justified. Uh, why uh, do you have uh, such a high subcontracting and why you cannot realize your project with, with, without this participant? tool or without this expertise that you are basically hiring somewhere else but i don't know whether we have colleagues from the grant management sector maybe they are they are better place to 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 explain the subcontracting yeah i think it can be addressed maybe later on uh, what is maybe important to say that there are some tasks that cannot be some sub subcontracted like for example that's the true the management project, the project management cannot be subcontracted okay and uh, also there is a last question like a uh, confirmation does the leading partner have to fill the role of project coordinator yes uh, the question the answer yes is yes okay if it's a consortium so lead applicant uh, means coordinator it, it's basically equal uh, I would try to really stress uh, that everything what I was presenting, it's it's in a call document. So if you read well the call document, uh, you will get all the answers normally. So all on the evaluation methodology, evaluation criteria, on the assistance, uh, eligibility, everything uh, is is written in there. But nevertheless, we are here for you to to help you with uh, with your application process. Uh, so. Don't hesitate to ask us questions. Don't hesitate to go to your self contact points. Yeah, and also regarding the part B, uh, limit, a page 35. So it's in oh, 45, 45. The, 45. The, the instructions, the instructions for each question, they should be kept in the template, right? Not yes, mind. I mean, the instructions should be kept and uh, it's very important that uh, you read these instructions and you satisfy all these instructions. I mean, uh, it doesn't mean that it's a small text uh, that you don't have to read it. it, it it's, it's the instructions and it's going to impact the score of the evaluation if you respond to all the, the points that are given in these instructions. So please don't remove them and follow them. Yeah, and also we ask you not to remove because it also helps the experts when they evaluate. So. Yeah. Um, okay. I mean, uh, we can go to the next point. Uh, Philippe, we will uh, now go to the uh, budgetary part. Uh, Itka, do you want to put on the presentation or do you want me to do it? Oh, we can, I think... uh, do you hear me? Do you hear me? Yes, Philippe, we can hear you. Okay. I, uh... Because uh, I, I did not see any reaction from Kalina, but okay. Hi, hello. Um, so we can share, or do you share? Because I want to pass quickly. Uh, so I, I could share mine, maybe. Maybe share yours, because then it it helps you also to go with the mouse and point out where you you want to give more impact. Okay. Up, up. Oh, do you see it? Yes. Okay. No. Uh huh. Ah, okay. Okay. You need to go to slideshow. Yes. You okay? So uh, thank you. Uh, my my name is uh, Philippe Bovin. I work in the same uh, unit as Tika in uh, just. Uh, H3. And so I have the, uh, and I thank Jitka and the colleagues for giving me the opportunity to uh, give you a, a few words of explanation about the new funding scheme that we adopted in DG just for the 2023 call and that we will keep on applying for the next call. Um, so I will. I will give you uh, an idea of uh, the system, why we went to the system, what is behind the system, and how it works. So please uh, do not hesitate to ask any question you have. It is quite new. Right? It is new for you. It is new for us. So uh, we, uh, we are learning by doing also. So it's interesting to have your feedback uh, for us also to uh, 
voilà, to see what's working, what's not working, what is easy to understand, what is not easy to understand. So, as you know, for the ones who have already applied quite a few times to, uh, for Ula, for, uh, oh, ah, voilà. Okay, for the ones uh, who have already applied, <laughs> I was uh, confusing my screen. Um, the ones who have already applied quite a few times for uh, our grant, we 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 went through quite a, a serious evolution over the last five to six years, where we we had the, the detail of the cost, uh, detail at budget, detail at final reporting, and everything needed to be matching. Or we were asking a lot of explanation. Then we we moved to the uh, control environment based on the use of resource where some costs needed to be justified above certain threshold. Then we introduced also the unit cost for travel accommodation and subsistence. And now we're moving to the lump sums. And in fact, this is really the, uh, the, the, the reflection of this evolution where we tend to focus less on the cost control and we we tend to put to shift the focus on the outputs um, because we think that it is a, a, a huge sim simplification it's a simplification for us it's also a simplification for the applicants so we should it should make our program more attractive as well uh, normally there will be less Discussion at final payment, so the, the, the payment should be quicker. And also, uh, we will, there won't be any ex post financial audit. So it's really we a focus of, we shift the focus. And also, uh, we, we also shift the focus where we used to have uh, a focus at final report on the cost control uh, we, we we were asking sometimes some uh, supporting evidence or some detail at final report at final re uh, payment stage and then after uh, the final payment uh, a percentage of the uh, projects were audited about 20 percent of the project were audited so there were quite high chances to be uh, to be audited and this was really an ex post control. Now we tend to shift the uh, control, uh, if we may call that as a control. We need to shift it uh, ex ante. Uh, we, we need to, to, to make the, the control uh, at budget stage as we do not control at final reporting stage from the cost point of view and not from the output point of view. So that's that's a little bit about the the focus. What what changed really, and then uh, as you know, and this is less interesting. I will not enter in, uh, into the detail. You, you, there are two types of uh, lump sums: type one and type two. And we in DG just for the action grants that we manage in DG just, we use the uh, lump sum type two for the action grants only. For the operating rent, we keep the reimbursement of actual and unit cost as it is an intervention in the budget of an organization. So what are the main changes with the introduction of the lump sum two? We focus on the completion of the activities and the activities are described in work packages. Work package is a bundle of activities. So if the work package is completed, we pay. If the uh, uh, work package is not completed, uh, voila, uh, we pay in function of the implementation. There is, of course, as we said, no justification of the cost at final payment stage. As my colleagues explained there is no change for the rest. So the call for proposal, the admissibility, the reporting period, the evaluation, the world criteria, uh, all this does not change. The eligibility activities, the eligible costs 
do not change either. The same cost categories as what we had so far. The rate of funding, the pre-financing uh, rate do not change. And uh, the um, uh, schedule of payment does not change either. So you see, from, well, from the procedure point of view, nothing changed. So what what uh, what is the rational behind this? Huh? Uh, as I as I explained during the beginning, this is the shift of focus, the evolution also in uh, in these regions, huh? the reflection: how can we improve the project, facilitate the life of our beneficiaries? But in fact, what we do here in the lump sum type two. We made ex ante, so in the budget, uh, the, the closest as possible to the reality, uh, an estimation that uh, an estimation of the cost that needs to be the closest as possible to the reality. So um, we, you will see that you introduce in the detailed budget table the cost per cost category. Uh, staff cost, uh, travel cost, uh, accommodation, etc. And in the end, with the help of this Excel tool, you will have uh, a cost, an estimated cost per work package. So, we, as we said, we shift the focus towards outputs, but it is still, we are still in a system of reimbursement of cost. The thing is, that we estimate the cost before the implementation of the project. So we have an estimation of the cost and we pay in function of the implementation. Okay, but we, we, we are still in this um, uh, spirit of cost reimbursement. Now, the, uh, the thing is also when you are, you are in a lump sum type two system, uh, we will see what is the budget attached to the, the grant agreement, but it is uh, an estimation of cost per work package. And a work package is divided in, in a few deliverables. So that means that if you say, voila, uh, and if you deliver all the, evid the, the evidence of the implementation of the action, the, the uh, report on the training, et cetera, et cetera, uh, that all the activities took place, you are entitled to receive the 100% that has been set um, in the beginning. And this, uh, no, independently of the cost that you made, of the payments that you made. Uh, so you are entitled to the 100% if you implemented 100%. And maybe you might have uh, your expenses, your actual expenses might be lower. What we used to have in a reimbursement system, as you had to claim cost in the end, you could adjust, even if you implemented 100% of the activities, you could adjust the cost that you would claim. So if your project was overestimated in the beginning, in the budget, you see, yeah, well, I implement all my activities, but in the end, I spent only 80% of my budget. So I asked only 80% the, uh, of, uh, of the initial, uh, the, of the maximum grant agreement to uh, the commission. No, this is not possible anymore in a lump sum type two uh, system. The, the, the payment of the lump sum will depend on the level of implementation, not on the costs that have been made. That's also the reason why ex at budget stage, we need to make sure that the costs are not inflated. So uh, we need to have cost estimates that are the closest possible to the reality. Okay, for this, we have this tool. This is the detailed budget table, we will see it. I think it's a very good tool for making a budget uh, it is structured per beneficiary and per work package. So each beneficiary uh, introduces the, uh, the cost that is thinks 
will be needed for implementing or for its participation to the implementation of the work package. And as we used to have before, the uh, cost estimation needs to uh, be eligible, huh? so they must be reasonable. They must be in line, of course, with the activities proposed. They must be in line with your normal uh, practices and in line with the national law. So this this all does not change. Okay. Uh, no, this the thing is also. Uh, as we said, and as my colleague said, nothing changed from uh, the uh, standard template that you are supposed to use, etc. The only thing that the additional mandatory uh, uh, part of the uh, proposal is the detailed budget sheet. So the detailed budget sheet must be submitted and it's a mandatory annex. So please, and this is important, please fill it in. An empty Excel sheet is not, voilà, it's not eligible. So we, uh, please fill it in. Please do not crack it. Do not try to modify the formulas. And uh, so, but so you 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 have this Excel sheet. We provide a lot of explanation. Uh, please fill it in and attach it to your proposal. Now, as we explained, also we we have a shift in focus. As we said, it's still a cost reimbursement system, uh, and, but we we have a shift on, on focus. Huh? We we have a shift towards uh, to a focus. Uh, oh, a shift of focus towards outputs, as we explained, because the payment will depend on the implementation of the output. That means that the output needs to be clearly defined. So we need to have outputs that are measurable and quantifiable. So we, we insist now, maybe more than what we did in the past, on the quality of the drafting of the proposal. We need to have objectives, specific objectives, task activities that translate in deliverable. Okay. So, uh, as I said, this is really important to have well-drafted work packages. Um, so because the payment will depend on the implementation of the work package. Now, also to, to check the, 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 the level of implementation of a work package, it is difficult to have one deliverable per work package. Uh, so we, we think, and uh, uh, it would be ideal to have three, four, five deliverables per work package. Um, so, voila. So we, we still have this limitation, I think, in the template of 15 deliverables. This may be, of course, exceeded. Okay. The, um, so we, we have uh, its cost per work package. We said that they should not be inflated, really related to the activities to be implemented and to the deliverables to be submitted. And now we have also the problem of work package one. Work package one is the coordination, the management and the coordination of the action. So we, we have quite a few uh, proposals where the cost of work package one seems to be inflated in view of the, the outputs of work package one. What, what is work package one? It's just the coordination of the activities. What is the coordination of the activities? It's maybe organizing three to four meetings with the, uh, with the consortium, maybe more, uh, sending emails, may, making this group on, on teams where you can exchange. We, we need to see what, what is the, uh, uh, what is what needs to be invested in work package one? So uh, uh, we we often come uh, uh, come uh, this proposal uh, where we have a thirty percent uh, uh, a value of work package one of thirty percent of the total cost. This is, in our opinion, too much. This is too much. Twenty percent also, I think, it's too much. So. We, we do not have uh, a, a percentage, but it should be limited. 
in view, certainly, of the output of work package one. Okay? And also considering, indeed, that there is no more this collection of supporting evidence, this complex financial management of the project. So this should also be reflected in the cost of work package one. So as we said, uh, we the evaluation is done as before uh, against the same award criteria as before, and the budget is evaluated under the quality criteria. So the, the, the budget is evaluated under the quality and in function of benchmarks, because indeed we, those are an estimate of actual cost. So we cannot, the, the, we cannot check if the costs are actual, of course, anymore, because the costs are made after this. Uh, so we, we, we base our evaluation, the experts, and we also, we participate, uh, we check it also, uh, when we make the grant, we prepare the grant, we check if the costs are reasonable, if they are in line with the outputs, but also if the value of the cost is acceptable. Uh, we check it in function of past experience, past project. We have an idea, for instance, of an average cost per training day. So all these data we have, and also uh, the, the experts have a lot of past references, but we will see that we use also other benchmarks. Okay, so in the end, what can we do? We, we evaluate at proposal stage, we evaluate the, the budget, so what can we do? We can recommend, we can do some recommendation. We can recommend uh, that uh, ineligible costs are removed. We uh, may ask the correction of overestimated cost. So we can make recommendation at after the evaluation or at evaluation and say, yeah, voila, uh, for instance, work package one of 30%, no, it is not acceptable, it should be reduced. Or we can say, ah, the uh, estimated cost, ah, to the estimation is too high in view of the output and should be reduced. So this kind of uh, recommendation can be made. Now, the thing is also that the budget is part of the evaluation under the quality. And there is also a question of equal treatment. So that means that if we have a, 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 a budget that is completely uh, inflated, that is not linked to the reality, of course, then this proposal should not be selected because of the uh, quotes and the quality being lower. So the recommendation on the, the change of the adaptation of the budget may not be a change of the budget, of course. It's more at the margin, okay? So that means that we need to pay attention at proposal stage on this budget estimation. Uh, so this is, uh, we will see now, we will have, uh, uh, we will see after the uh, uh, the working of the detailed budget sheet, but the, the main, the most important thing is that the detailed budget sheet is based on units and cost per unit. So a unit times a cost per unit, and then we have the total cost. It's, it's really easy. It's easy to use. Now, what is important to understand as well, when we know that it is a unit and a cost per unit, what it is, what is important to understand is what is a unit. So for the staff cost, a unit is one month, one month, or oh, sorry, full time for one person. So it's one person month. So if I have uh, for uh, under my proposal 24 units, uh, 24 units staff cost for work package one, it's uh, two years full time for the management. So you see, two years full time, eight hours a day, it's a lot of time. Huh? You need, you can do quite some stuff huh, uh, during this time. So the, um, the cost per unit then is the actual cost per person divided by 12 months, which is really easy. 
Okay, so you will see also in the detailed budget table that you can customize the cost categories and have the director. You can you can adapt it a little bit in function of the the cost categories that uh, you have in your own organization. And uh, what is important when we will analyze the budget, we will use as a benchmark the Horizon Dashboard. The Horizon Dashboard has been developed by DG RTD that has billions uh, in, in grants, and they spent the billions in grants over, I don't know, many years, and they made an analysis in, of the staff cost all over Europe in function of the country and the position occupied the, in function of the country, the type of organization and the position occupied in an organization. So it's a very detailed analysis based on a lot of uh, historical data. Uh, so it gives a good estimate of what is an average in a certain country. We will base our um, cost estimation of the staff cost on this horizon dashboard. That means that if it is in line with the, we, 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 we do not say, of course, the actual, you, you introduce the cost on the basis of your actual cost. So it's your actual cost divided by 12. And this is the uh, unit cost, uh, the unit cost for, uh, for one person, one person month. But we will see if this is in line with the average that has been calculated by the DRTD. When it is completely overestimated, of course, we, we will have we will have questions. When it is in line, it is perfectly acceptable. Uh, okay, so this is this is one of the benchmark we use. Um, then, of course, in the uh, budget, you are still allowed to use the SME owners without a salary. Uh, so it's for the owners of uh, small companies and the volunteers. In these cases, you need to refer, of course, uh, to the commission decision for those two, two types of unit cost and use the rates that are set in those two decisions. For the volunteers, pay attention because the, uh, the costs are expressed per day uh, and uh, in the decision and not per month. So they need to be multiplied. Okay. Uh, then, the subcontracting, other goods, etc., they must be in line for us for the other ones with the outputs of the project. For the equipment, we provide you with a special sheet for the calculation of the depreciation. Okay, then for the travel, what is the unit for the travel? It is one person return trip. So I go to Brussels from Paris and I go back from Brussels to Paris, this is one trip. If I have a three person traveling, it is three unit. For the accommodation, it is one night spent on the, for, on the travel for the action. And the third distance is one day spent on travel for the action. Okay, so if I go from Paris to Brussels with five people, I have five travel units. I spent two days in Brussels, I have 10 accommodation units. I spent two nights, sorry. Okay? And the same for the subdistance. Now, the thing is, uh, of course, the uh, number of units of travel, accommodation, and subsistence must be in line with the activities that you described in the description of work. If you, uh, voila, we, we need to be, to have an idea, tiens, is the number of units for travel in line with the number of meetings that are planned under work package one, for instance, or work package two. We have an idea. Uh, it's the same for the cost for the travel, for the accommodation. Is it in line? Uh, with the number of units, and we check the cost. The unit cost we check uh, on the basis, uh, we use the benchmark of uh, the unit, uh, the decision of the unit on the unit cost for travel and subsistence. 
Okay, this is the commission decision uh, we used to have to pass. We, we, you were suppo supposed to use also the unit cost in the uh, previous grants if you participated in the course in the course in the past years. Uh, so there is this commission decision. Uh, it is in attachment to the uh, master grant agreement. It is also to be found on the funding and tender. And you have here in the presentation all the rules for calculation. Okay, the calculation of the distance, etc. The same uh, for the uh, accommodation and subsistence. Okay, so for the subsistence, it's, uh, it's a 24 hours period, so it's a number of days. Uh, you, you, you spend three days, it's three subsistence. Difficult to, or you may put decimals as well. Okay, so we we will use that for uh, estimating if the costs are uh, more or less in line. Of course, we cannot check at uh, reporting stage if the units have well been charged because there is no cost reporting at reporting stage anymore. So, but. At budget stage, we check yeah, voila, is the number of units in line with the number of people traveling, is the uh, number of units of accommodation and subsistence in, in line with the duration of the trip and the number of people traveling, etc. Okay. And then we have we make a grant agreement uh, where we have uh, uh, the, the lump sums that are set. Uh, that, voilà, the, the, the overall lump sum is set in the grant agreement, and then we have the split of the lump sum per beneficiary and per work package. And this is the new Annex 2 to the grant agreement. Before we used to have an Annex 2 based on the, uh, the, the, the cost per beneficiary, now it is an Annex 2 based on the uh, work package and estimated cost per beneficiary per work package. That means that the costs actually incurred are not relevant. You spent less, you spent more. It is not relevant. Uh, as long as you implement the action as defined in the grant agreement. Okay. For the payment, voila, you need to demonstrate that the action has been properly implemented and the deliverables are uh, implemented in the time set for the action. That may be extended by a via an amendment as before, but voila, the deliverables have all been implemented during the, the implementation of the grant agreement, and they've been implemented according to the contract, and you are entitled to the payment. Okay, and this implementation is, of course, demonstrated by the submission of deliverables. I'm sorry. Um, it's uh, demonstrated by the, uh, voilà, the submission of deliverables. If you were supposed to make a, a research work on, I don't know which population, I don't know in which countries or for pages, that this research work needs to be uh, submitted as a deliverable and, and then you are entitled to the payment of it. Okay, so the budget flexibility is the same as before. So you may transfer, you may uh, you may change, you may add the beneficiaries. Uh, uh, in, in case of addition or, or or change of beneficiaries or withdrawal of beneficiaries, this may require a change of the of the budget, of course, of the annex two. Then we might use, of course, the, the detailed budget table again. The detailed budget table is part of the proposal, but it's not part of the grant agreement. This is important. The only budget information that we have in the grant agreement is the Annex 2 uh, but, um, beneficiary work package. Okay, voila. So we, we come now to the detailed budget table. Uh, as we said, do not modify the formulas. We we add 
path, not a lot. We have a few, yeah, a few uh, modified retail budget table, and that's not the idea. And it is a tool for uh, calculating the lump sum. It is not to be modified. Uh, now we we had some experience with the detailed budget table and so uh, already a few calls that we use them, and still it is I think not clear for beneficiaries. Uh, a lot of beneficiaries do still not understand the concept of unit. What is a unit and a cost per unit? So it occurs really quite frequently that for staff cost we have one unit at 40,000 euros for one month's work it's quite expensive so uh, we we need to well the, the concept of unit cost of unit is pretty important so um, when you will open the detailed budget table you will see that there are a lot of instructions these instructions are important and should be carefully read Okay, so please read them because they will well, lead you uh, in the uh, um, filling in of the detailed budget table. What is important here is to fill uh, this box. Uh, what needs to be filled in is the co-financing rate. If you do not fill in the co-financing rate, then it will not work. And you need also to specify the maximum grant amount uh, as stipulated in the code. Now, the thing is that a lot of our codes do not specify a maximum grant amount. But then you, as you may not leave this box empty, you just put the maximum amount of the code. If it's a 4 million code, you just put 4 million. Okay. Uh, as I explained, you can define, you can uh, more uh, be more precise as regard the type of uh, personal working of your organization. Um, and you, you may have a type one director, type two senior project, type three administrative assistant, whatever you want. Okay. No. Uh, we you need to introduce each beneficiary in the table. So each you need you well, you add a beneficiary, add a beneficiary, and then you push apply changes. It is important. If you do not push apply changes, the system does not record it. The same for the work package. You need to introduce each work package. So one. First one, other work package, work package one, other work package two, et cetera, et cetera. And again, apply change. Huh? And this is the system working behind the scene uh, for registering all the changes that you made. Still the instruction, we keep it to be read carefully. As we said, this is the presentation. We have one uh, sheet per uh, beneficiary per work package. So it is, it is easy. You have to fill in only the units and the cost per units. And the table makes the, comp uh, the computation. Uh, you have the different cost categories. Huh? Uh, you, you are used to, huh? these are the, we do not change the cost categories compared to what we had in a, a, an actual cost reimbursement system. It is the same. We just set the level of the reimbursement or the, the amount to be reimbursed uh, ex ante at proposal stage. The table now, the new table accept decimals. In the beginning, it did not. Now we have, uh, you can enter uh, decimals. If uh, a staff member is working only one and a half months before you have to round it or to compensate it be be between the different staff member, now you can put 1.5 months. Uh, if, uh, uh, and this is important also, uh, if a beneficiary does not contribute to a work package, you leave the cell empty. Okay? This is a rather basic example uh, of filling in the, the staff cost. 
voilà, one unit, the cost per unit, and the total cost is computed. So the thing is important, which is important also for the for the staff cost and for the other cost as well, is the average. As for instance, in this case, you have uh, 2.5 units of project managers, but those project managers are two different guys and they do not have the same pay of the in the organization because one has 10 years in science and, and the, uh, the other one uh, has just been uh, hired. So they do not have the same level of weight. What you do is you take an average. You take, so the 3,500 in this case is an average of the salary of the two, uh, of the cost of the two project manager working on the project. Okay, so average is important. Subcontracting, the same. We have three subcontracts, and this is the average cost per subcontract. For the subcontract, please do not forget to uh, do not forget to document in uh, the DOE why you need subcontracting. Subco and also, do not confuse. Uh, subcontracting and provision of goods and, uh, and purchases of uh, of uh, good uh, works and services. If uh, you subcontract uh, copies, uh, this is uh, uh, this is provision of goods. Uh, the renting of a room, this is provision of goods. The subcontracting is really uh, subcontracting part of the implementation of the action. Okay, and. When it is real subcontracting, because as you know, normally consortia are supposed to have the uh, capacity to implement the action. So if you need to call the point subcontracting, it needs to be documented. And of course, for subcontracting, as for any cost, it is the best value for money. Uh, for the travel and subsistence, here again, we give an example. Uh, again, it is an average amount. Uh, if we have for subsistence, yeah, that was it. For, for subsistence, if for the travel, for instance, if you have uh, uh, in, in, the, in the work package uh, one, uh, three meetings each time in different countries, different cities, you take the average of the trip to these different cities and the number of units is the number of people traveling. Uh, here also the same for subsistence with one day meeting in Italy and another one in Denmark, we take the average. And if it's one day, it is uh, the number of units is uh, voila, it's the, num the same as the number of participants. It's, if it's two days, time two. Three days is time two. Time two. Okay. Uh, equipment. There is a special sheet for the depreciation. Okay. Voila. So the thing is that you need to fill in manually. There is no automatic transfer between the two sheets. And what we recommend also is to fill in the any comment worksheet. If something, in your opinion, needs explanation, if there are average that are difficult to trace or whatever, please document it. Okay. Um, and then the indirect costs are automatically computed. So of course, this is also worth putting in the any comments if the one of the beneficiary is also beneficiary of an operating grant, please inform, then we can adapt when making the grant. Okay? And then, of course, you need to double click on the X, uh, voilà, on this uh, create Excel S6 document. Voilà. And this is the budget. Now, I think it would be, in, but I guess you have already seen it. The, uh, the uh, detailed budget table, um, but um, what, what is important is that you still have also the cost, all the costs per 
cost category. Uh, uh, and then they are translated in word package. But well, I do not have it here, but if you if you find it interesting, you, you, you can check it here by yourself in the uh, in the detailed budget table. You will see that they are they are structured completely the same way as we did before, plus a work package. Okay, and the level of implementation of this work package will determine the payment in the end. And this changes, of course, all the reporting process as well, where beneficiaries will not have to report on cost incurred, but they will have to report on implementation of activities. Okay, voila. So I, I, I think this is it for us, for, for me. I don't know if there are any questions. Oh, I guess everybody is gone. Oh, yep. Not yet everybody. Not yet everybody. Please, do you have any questions for Philip? Uh, thank you, Philip. It was very comprehensive and hands-on uh, presentation, very clear. Do we have any questions from the uh, national authorities? I saw that there was one question, but in, in the meantime, it was already responded by other colleagues from the grant management sector. In any case, uh, we have uh, uh, some other questions that we were receiving previously that maybe uh, we could ask. Um, for example, is the work of consultants, for example, for data collection, considered as subcontracting? The work of? Of consultants, for example, consul for co consultants that can be collecting data. Is it a subcontracting or how would you it see it? It depends. The definition, if, if you hire a, a natural person who is a consultant, so if you have a, a guy that you work with, uh, he is a natural person, you hire him to work for you for uh, collecting data under your supervision in your premises uh, and uh, voila. It works really for you as a natural person, then it can be charged as staff. If, on the contrary, you call upon a company uh, for collecting data, uh, a consulting company, you say, yeah, well, I will call upon Ernst and Young or whatever, uh, then of course, this is more subcontracting. This is a subcontract. Uh, mm -hmm. It depends also on the nature of the contract. Then we have a question about co-financing. So what is considered as co-financing? Is it work input or voluntary work? And what rules apply to consortium partners regarding co-financing? Can only one party pay the co-financing or do we need to share among consortium members? No, the, you, can, you can share, you, you can have only one participant paying for the co-financing. You may charge volunteer. Co-financing means, voila, we, we finance up to 90%, the 10, the 10 remaining percent need to be financed by other sources. So it may be the uh, beneficiaries own resources. If you have reserves or whatever, you can use your own funds for that, or you may indeed charge volunteers uh, volunteer cost is unit cost. The volunteer cost is a cost that you do not have to cash out. And that's the reason why we have unit cost, because it's an estimate of, of this cost. And, uh, and this may cover indeed your, uh, your, your participation in the project, your 10% participation in the project. Uh, and it may be charged by each beneficiary or only by one beneficiary, as long as this 10% is covered. Um, now, for the, for the volunteers, you may charge volunteers, but you know the, the, the volunteers' work will not be reimbursed by the Commission, of course. The Commission will always pay the uh, cost effectively exposed. Mm. Thank you. Then there is a question about pre-financing. The, yeah. the estimate of the costs mm -hmm. effectively, yeah. that, we, 
that will be exposed. Yeah? It's a, we are in a lump sum system, of course. Thank you. Then we have a questions about pre-financing. So what level of pre-financing should we expect and to whom from the consortium it's going to be paid? Yeah, you, you should expect always as before the 80%. The uh, so the EU contribution is 90% of the total cost, huh? of the total estimated cost. Uh, and of this EU contribution, uh, the EU contribution is a 90%, you will receive 80% uh, after the signature of the grant agreement that will be paid to the coordinator and the coordinator is expected to redistribute the uh, pre-financing among the members of the consortium according to the consortium agreement because there must be a consortium agreement between the members and without delay. Okay, thank you. Uh, then again, the question about subcontracting now from the angle of public procurement processes. Is there anything uh, that we are uh, obliging from the Commission perspective concerning public procurement or is it on the uh, beneficiaries to apply the national uh, provisions or how do we foresee it? Uh, we, we say always, voila, uh, what you, you need to have uh, best value for money. The idea is best value for money and the project needs to be cost effective. So what we used to do in the past when the, it was a cost reimbursement system, we were checking or the auditors were checking in case of uh, call for tenders, uh, we were checking the number of proposals received, if the one chosen was the best value for money, if it was the lowest price, and if it was not the lowest price, why another one was chosen, etc. We wanted to see a, a, a few price offers. That was the system working in the ancient world. Now we do not check that, of course, because we do not check the uh, uh, the costs. There, there is no cost reporting anymore, uh, and we and there is no ex post audit anymore. So this is something that we cannot check, but we expect of course, the beneficiaries to, uh, to, have to, to, to charge the best value for money in case of subcontracting or in case for, of call for tenders. So if you put in your proposal 10,000 for subcontracting and you need, as you know, to describe in uh, the description of work which task will be subcontracted, we will estimate at proposal stage, when we analyze the proposal, if the cost that you charge for the subcontracting are reasonable. So now, how can you charge your cost, estimate your cost? Because you already did it. Maybe you can call upon a, a, a few suppliers at proposal as well, but the idea is of course that you charge the best price at proposal stage and that's something that we will check also mm -hmm. uh, and then of course for for the rest during the implementation of the project it is purely transparent to us of course huh? mm -hmm. you so follow normally, your national law so normally the, this you would expect to have it mentioned maybe in the comments or also in the subcontracting parts of the of the proposal. No, they, that that they already are choosing the best value for money. Uh, that's uh, if you can document a little more in the subcontracting in the uh, in the description of work. Why not? It is always useful information. If you say, yeah, voila, we have uh, we have compared already a few offers. Why not? Giving documentation is never bad. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe yeah. if there are no other questions, I have a last question. Uh, we are planning to develop a new digital tool which needs maintenance. The tool will be developed in the partnership. Can the partner somehow plan cost for the maintenance of the tool for 10 years? Hmm. No, for 10 years. Uh, this, is, this is always difficult because normally but, but the, the cost needs to be made during the implementation of the project. So this is this is the rule. Uh, either the cost are made or the invoice are, are received in the actual cost reimbursement system. 
now we are no longer in a in an actual cost reimbursement system. Uh, we uh, so in fact, voila, we we cannot control anymore afterwards if the costs have been made during the implementation of the project. But at budget stage, we need to have the assurance, and when we analyze the cost, they need to be reasonable for an implementation of two years. If you document in your project, we are going to charge 10, 20 years uh, after the implementation of the project, this is difficult. But at the same time, it's always difficult to us also to, uh, to, to just refuse everything because it is our interest also that the application remain available and that the project is still uh, alive in, even after the implementation of the project. So if it is a condition, if the amount is reasonable, and if the duration is also reasonable, and if it is explained in the technical annex, find the dough, and if it is explained that it is a condition indeed for keeping the project alive and that it will still be maintained and available on this website or whatever. If it is documented, then it may be available. It may be acceptable indeed, but it must be documented. Okay, thank you very much, Philip. Do we have any other questions in the chat? Please. Now it's the time. We reply to the other questions. Okay, thank you then. Uh, I think there is one. Uh, uh, but no, 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 this is Maria was responding. Okay. Okay. So then uh, I would uh, very much uh, would like to thank all the speakers uh, from okay. the policy unit, thank Kalina you. and Agnieszka, uh, Filip and uh, Maria uh, for, from uh, grant management sector. Uh, and I would like to recall uh, to the national authorities implementing paid transparency directive that this is your chance. Uh, we extended the call, especially for you that you have time to prepare the applications. The probability if you submit the applications are high that you can uh, achieve the funding. Uh, bear in mind that you have uh, 6.1 million allocated uh, to this uh, priority and you are not alone. You can uh, reach to the national contact points, national serif contact points uh, in your countries or in the neighboring countries and they will guide you through the process of application. They will help you with the application and also with the budget table and if you need further assistance we can also help you. After this meeting, we are going to gather the questions and answers. We are going to uh, also send you uh, the presentations uh, so you can use it as a reference document. We are also going to post the links on the uh, website on the funding and tender portal that is dedicated to our call. So once again, uh, please seize this opportunity. We are waiting uh, for your applications. Don't hesitate to come back to us if you need more help. And uh, with this, I'm wishing you a nice afternoon, a nice weekend and um, uh, have a nice day. Thank you.